Hi Earl, how are you doing? Good. That's good. So let's start at the beginning. When and where were you born? Well, my family moved from New York State to Southern California in 1941. So I was eight years old at the time. And how was it growing up in Southern California? It was good. I grew up in the North Los Angeles area and lived in the same house all the way through college, finishing college until I got married with my family. And where did you go to school then? I went to school at a college, private college, Occidental College. And what did you study there? Um, my major there was commerce and finance. And how then did you get to Arizona? Well, in, we lived in uh, Redlands, California during the 1990s, 80s and 90s. And uh, our married children lived in the Bay Area and Scottsdale. So that was about the same commute in both directions. But the Bay Area family moved to Australia in the year 2000. And so we moved in 2002 uh, to move close to the Scottsdale family. And we came to Dewey Humboldt to be in a closer communication and visiting time. And what attracted you to the area? I'm curious. Well, my wife had grown up with horses and she wanted to get back with horses. And so Dewey Humboldt was a place where you could have horses. And it was the closest part of the Prescott metropolitan area to uh, commute to Scottsdale back and forth. And do you still currently live in the Dewey Humboldt area? Yes, I do. We've been here ever since we moved here in 2002. And how did you get involved in civic organizing and politics? Well, I've had several careers in my work life, one of which was analyst work in local government agencies in California. In addition to that, I was a sales rep for two national manufacturing companies, industry leaders, and an officer in a company bringing business, recruiting business to the area in California, and some time as a management trainer. So that let me have a basic interest in the community and things that make communities successful. And what are some of the things that you have been involved in the past then? Well, since we moved here in 2002, at that time I joined the Dewey Humboldt Community Organization as a way to become familiar with the area and the future plans for the area. And the Dewey Humboldt Advisory, uh, Dewey Humboldt Community Organization is an advisory group at that time. Dewey Humboldt was an unincorporated county uh, area, and the advisory group was advisory to the County Board of Supervisors and the County Planning Commission to review, tasked with the review of proposed zone changes and developments in the Dewey Humboldt community, and then provide recommendations to the county officials who had the responsibility to make those decisions. And how was it working with or with the Dewey Humble Community Organization? Well, I was a member there for three years while the subject of incorporation came up, but the community organization recommendations to the county for land use matters was pretty regularly followed, although not always. So there was always a little bit of conflict, but that's normal in land use decisions everywhere. And can you tell me the story of how um, 
Dewey Humble became incorporated since you were involved in the beginning? Yes, I was on the initial incorporation committee that worked on the proposal to incorporate Dewey Humble. And what was going on here is at that time in 2004, 2005, was a series of annexation proposals from the neighboring town of Prescott Valley, who was marching along on Highway 69 with uh, the intent to annex property that was future would be future commercial and it was coming ever closer to the residential community. And the citizens were very upset because they thought that that do, uh, Prescott Valley was going to annex the residential part of the community as well, and they were not in favor of that. So they set about, DHCO set about to explore the feasibility of incorporating Dewey Humboldt which would block further annexations from Prescott Valley. And um, after the incorporation occurred, uh, how did you then become involved with the local government? The incorporation was in December of 2005 and the incorporating rules in Arizona say that the County Board of Supervisors will appoint the initial town council and then at the next regular election date, uh, the council members will run for election. So I was appointed as one of the initial town council members by the Board of Supervisors. So I began uh, with, the, with the council uh, right after the town was formed. And how was it to be at the beginning of such developments? Like, like I don't know. Well, the, the town never had anybody helping out who had been involved with incorporations and with the needs of municipal government. And so it was maybe a mainly a citizen effort to talk to other people who had incorporated previously, but the most recent one had been 10 years before. And so the citizen members of the incorporation committee just talked to other city people in surrounding cities to get a feel for what they might be facing in the way of costs and income and city problems, town problems. And then how long from you becoming or being part of the Dewey Humboldt Council did you then step into the shoes of the mayor? Well, the, the first series of elections was in, oh, maybe 2007. And I de decided not to run for the council because things seemed to be up and going along pretty good. And we had an interim town manager who looked to be uh, doing a good job. And I didn't see the need for me to continue. I was basically a retired person. And so I didn't uh, come back into the picture until the first mayoral election which was after that. And um, what happened at that election? Like, how was it to run and all, of, and all the different things you have to do? Well, my previous experience, I'd seen a lot of local politics as anyone who lives in an incorporated city has seen and had been semi-involved in in looking at how those were run. So the job of campaigning was something I was somewhat familiar with. And uh, I knew the kinds of issues that the town faced on the matters of 
law enforcement and roads and tax income and things that were going to need to be provided. So I basically campaigned with those basic issues uh, on, on the topics. And when did you officially win the position of mayor? The mayor's office is a two-year term. Council members serve a four-year term. So that means, and they alternate. So every two years, there's a new choice for mayor. And I think it was probably 2008 election was I ran for mayor and served two years. And so what were some of the first issues that you started looking at as a mayor? I'm just curious. Well, the main issues the town had was, was frankly, an education problem, educating citizen council members on the things that towns need and, and have to uh, be prepared for and, and plan for the future. We had a good city manager. I had somewhat of a background. And so all those things like uh, transferring responsibility from the county to the town for uh, services like law enforcement, roads, and land use planning had to be worked out. And it took the help of the many agencies who were providing that service from the county and others uh, from surrounding towns to help us with that. And so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to ask you how you first became aware of the Iron King Mine tailings. Well, the Iron King Mine is visible to anybody who dri drives up to Dewey Humboldt. It's a prominent uh, landmark right at the highway, and it's visible and noticeable because of its orange color and large size of mine tailings. Uh, but clear back in the days before incorporation, one of the basic issues in front of the Dewey Humboldt Community Organization was the problem with the dust blowing from the tailings pile onto the residential area and citizen complaints about it was affecting the, their way of living and that they were bothered by the fact that maybe there was something that needed to be studied about whether that was healthy or unhealthy. So it was always visible here as a long-term problem dating way back. It just surfaced when people thought that the town would give a more coordinated and stronger voice politically to that problem. So it had been around ever since I got here and before then. And how about the Humboldt smelter stack? When did you become aware of that? Early on, the Humboldt smelter stack, which is another visible icon in the town, every, anyone who drives to this town, sees it when they arrive. But it's a tall 1910 or earlier constructed uh, masonry stack. And it was run down, unsafe. And I learned early on from people who lived here a long, long time that it had already been slated for demolition and drilled for that process. So it was just waiting to fall down or brought down, be brought down. And similar to you hearing about the stack and it being uh, something that needed to be demolished, did you hear anything about if there was contamination on either the smelter site or the mine tailing site? Just the general feeling by the people here that it needed to be tested and maybe it was affecting groundwater in the area and nobody knew what the mineral content of the slag pile or the 
tailings pile was, and so there was concern, but no, no scientific knowledge that I was made aware of. And when did you first start hearing that a superfund process was going to be applied to both the mine and the smelter sites? Well, the town had an environmental committee, which was created because of the overall concern about the tailings pile. And the environmental committee thought that the town, being an organized governmental unit, would have more say in a request to the federal government to come and take a look. And the EPA should come and study what they felt was likely a problem. And, and the town, as a governmental unit, uh, was the proper way to give some power to the request to the federal government. And what was your initial reaction at that time about the Superfund process? Well, I'd worked in Southern California where working around existing Superfund sites taught me that once the Superfund site has been declared and the work was, the preliminary work was done to to reach that conclusion, that it was a 20 plus years long process to get any resolution. There's many examples across the country where Superfund designation wears on the area for more than 20 years. And it has a negative connotation for many people who live in the area or for many people who would like to consider living in the area. So it's, in a sense, it can be a liability, even though it might be a necessity to find out what's there. And I tried to raise a, a bit of caution about rushing into inviting the federal government and the EPA to come take a look because I knew if they found something that it, the town wouldn't get any, any kind of immediate um, action to correct it. And can you talk about some of the discussions that were happening at the time regarding the site? Yeah, the town had... Um, an individual approached the town council with a private industry proposal to, in effect, remine the tailings pile by trucking it away, running it through a process to extract other kinds of minerals that they felt were present and that they had tested to be present and that they would, as a private industry, make a business out of re-refining the tailing pile and do it in another location. So that kind of proposal meant taking the trailing, tailings pile to some other place where it was an industrial type location and they could process it there. So that sounded like a shorter term way to uh, tackle the problem of the existence of the pile in the first place. And that had an appeal, but the financials of the party that approached didn't turn out to be quite as as good as they had as they had said they were. Although we did not ever do anything really significant in researching their capabilities. And do you remember who uh, the business people were or the industries? No, I don't, but the, but the records would show that period of time when the council deliberated on that private proposal. Okay. And do you remember being presented information on the site when you were looking at it becoming a Superfund site uh, or the maybe when these industries were proposing their business plan on it? Do you remember looking at information? No, I never got very far because the environmental committee had said its 
goal is EPA would would be the only viable answer, and the council uh, felt pretty much the same way. So that's the way the town moved. And uh, did you ever interact with the United States Environmental Protection Agency? I'm just curious. No. No. And then what are some of the findings uh, or from the investigations of this uh, committee or the environmental committee? Well, their findings came through in little pieces over a long period of time. And they found that the the pollution present in the in the uh, tailings pile had progressed into areas of the town through normal runoff and and movement of of dirt plus uh, individuals in the old days had used the mine tailings as free dirt to move to their property to improve or regrade or do something at their property so that we were aware that that there were residential properties that had tried to utilize part of the tailings pile on their own property so that maybe if there was a problem with the content of the tailings that it would be larger than the visible site itself. So can you talk uh, about the activities leading to the council voting regarding the Superfund site? Because you were in the mayor position right That's now. That's correct. I was the mayor when the town voted to uh, request the EPA or to have the governor request EPA to come and, and study the site. And there were several council meetings with large attendance by the citizens uh, with issues and and concerns about the nature of the tailings pile and what might be there and what, what might be harming children and citizens with the dust in the air and and potential questions about groundwater pollution because everyone in the area here not the town of Humboldt, but in the area, uses groundwater uh, for, their, uh, for their water supply, drinking water. And so there were lots of well-attended council meetings, quite a few, where citizens were now finding that they could demand from their local government that they take some action, and the action was 90% um, request the EPA to come out and study it and determine what's what's wrong, in, if anything, in that tailings pile with respect to human health. And I'm going to ask you this question, but we we're talking about it earlier that you might not remember, but how did the council vote on the Superfund site? And I don't remember the actual vote, and I think the records will will indicate that very well. And what happened after this was decided? Do you remember activities at the governmental level, community level? Not so many. It was it was it was like the incorporation question. Once the governor agreed to ask EPA, the the public concern died down because they felt that they had achieved what their goal was, and that was to get the local government to ask the governor and the governor to respond by asking the federal government to come in and do the study. So everybody calmed down, and uh, there wasn't a lot of concern expressed to the council that I can recall after that action by the governor. Waiting for EPA became the watchword. And how and why did you decide uh, not to run for the second term as the Dewey Humboldt mayor? I thought things were pretty much going as they should, and I didn't want another career. <laughs> 
And then do you still keep up with the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund site? I do, but just through the newspaper articles and periodically I attend some council meetings and I try to make a council meeting where there's going to be an EPA report. But uh, otherwise I don't keep a very active hand in that subject. And I'm just curious, I ask a lot of my interviewees if the Superfund site or what you were involved with did it change your thinking about uh, chemical exposure in your community or in your home? Well, the fact that we had a lot of homes here where people over the years without thinking or knowing whether there's a problem or thinking about a problem had used the tailings for their own purposes. And those tailings were, of course, never created with that in mind. So the mine tailings turned out to be free dirt for a lot of people over many years. And that did, that was a surprise and did change my thinking a little bit about how not only natural contamination occurs where you might be living, but prior residents could have brought it there uh, unexpectedly or unsuspectingly. And then the, this is one of the last questions. What advice do you have for state and federal governments that oversee the cleanup? For the cleanup? Uh-huh. There's no good answer for the cleanup of the tailings pile. It's a very large flat top pile. The prospect of Covering it and growing something on top is very unlikely in today's world because there's no water supply that could water any crops. The cost of any material that would grow something and the needed amount to put a two-foot topper on that size of a flat top pile is prohibitive for a community of this many people. And uh, there's no sewage disposal potential. There's no clean water potential in sight for that area. So it'll be many, many years, and I don't know what EPA will suggest, but it would be extremely expensive and beyond this community's ability if it were to cover the pile and try to grow something on it and find a water supply that would do that. Um, so I don't see any big change for the next decade or more in the side pile or in the, in the tailings pile, either one. And then what would you like, would you recommend or like to see future generations learn from this experience? Well, I don't know. Maybe be aware of the things you're doing to contribute to our environment in other ways because the consequences downstream 20 years may impact a lot of people negatively, people who aren't presently there or here can be impacted in the future by things that we carelessly do today. And that's something that we ought to be more concerned about. It gets you back to the questions of global warming and things like that. It's a be careful to be not constructing future serious problems for others. And how would you like your memory to be remembered in this area? Just that I tried to participate in helping the community become a community after it incorporated. And that's it. And is there anything else that you would like to discuss that I might have missed? No, I can't say there is. And I appreciate your, your time and involved in this in this subject and your work with 